Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Microsoft, and more specifically Xbox, have been dominating the news cycle for what feels like months now, leading many, like fan and friend of the show, Young Orbit, to ask, what is Xbox's strategy for this new generation of consoles, and more importantly, will it work? There's a lot to unpack here, so let's get into it. So the first, and I think probably the biggest part of their strategy going forward, has been to turn around this conception, this, this negative perception that people have had towards Xbox and Microsoft since the start of the Xbox One generation. And if you've been a fan of Xbox or have just been paying attention to the game space for the last couple of years, then you know that the number one thing that people have held against Xbox for that entire time, and some still do to this day, is this notion that Xbox has no games. And as I've said multiple times on this channel, I don't think that that was ever true. Xbox always had games, it was just that they never really lived up to the critical acclaim and general popularity that the games of their competitors like Sony or Nintendo were able to achieve on the PS4 and the Switch. But frankly, it's largely because the PS4 and the Switch have just been killing it. Like, Xbox hasn't been doing worse than usual, it's just that everyone else has stepped their game up, and now it's time for Xbox to do the same thing. And so since the start of the Xbox One generation, they have increased their first party studio family from the five studios that it was back then to the 23 studios that it is now which is by far the largest studio family of any of the console manufacturers. But it's not just a matter of size. You know, you can hire a thousand employees and still put out bad games. So they weren't just targeting a number of games, but quality. And if you look at the list of studios that they've acquired, it's very similar to the list that I would have written if I was choosing the best studios that I would want to acquire to make my studio family as powerful as possible. We're talking about teams like Ninja Theory, Obsidian, Double Fine, Playground Games, and of course, Bethesda. I won't get into too much detail about exactly what their first party, o party is or is capable of because I've already taken care of that in this previous video as well as Bethesda's acquisition in general in this video, but the fact of the matter is that adding this massive amount of extremely talented teams has completely, in my mind and the mind of many others, turned around their entire first party game output. And specifically being able to lock down those Bethesda games as exclusives, which they have recently come out and announced that that is exactly what they're doing, is a huge win for the Xbox First Party. Just the idea of being able to have things like Fallout and Elder Scrolls and Doom exclusive to places where Game Pass exists means that people are going to flock to your service and your ecosystem in huge numbers. But the number one thing that Xbox was looking for in terms of the teams that they acquired was the leadership structure of those studios. Xbox doesn't want to go in and change who these studios are or the way that they work. If you acquire a team like Obsidian, you want them to make quality RPGs because that's what they're known for. If you acquire Double Fine, you want them to continue to make Double Fine games. You don't want to interfere with that, what they are, because if you start doing that, then it almost completely defeats the purpose of acquiring that studio. So they want studios that they know already put out a quality product and that has that leadership structure that they know they can trust. And that's why you see many of the teams that they've acquired have really big name people at the head of the studio. We're talking about people like Brian Fargo or Fergus Urquhart and Todd Howard who are basically just the masters of the Western RPG or people like Pete Hines and Tim Schafer who are just absolutely beloved in the video game industry 
or hell, they just got Tango Gameworks in this Bethesda deal, which is led by Shinji Mikami, the person who invented the survival horror genre. So Xbox is looking for teams like that, who they know with the added resources and flexibility that being part of the Microsoft family grants to them will be able to increase their already quality product into something absolutely game-changing. So with all these new acquisitions and improvements to their first-party studio family and the games that they're going to be able to put out, that negative perception of the Xbox first-party lineup is all but solved. In fact, at this point, I think, based on your personal taste in video games, you could even argue that the Xbox first-party lineup is better or more enticing than that of Sony or Nintendo. And based on the fact that we have in multiple different interviews heard both Phil Spencer and Microsoft CEO Sadia Nadella talking about their desire to continue to grow and acquire new studios from this point on, we know that it's only going to improve and get better from here. I mean, the, the rumors of studios that they're looking into range from very small teams like Bloober to middle of the road teams like Remedy that make amazing games, all the way up to massive publishers like Sega. And just about everybody in between has at one point or another been rumored to be considered as an acquisition for Microsoft. So. I think that is well and truly taken care of. But it wasn't just the games that people took issue with as far as Xbox was concerned. At the launch of the Xbox One, it was both more expensive and less powerful than its competitor, the PlayStation 4. Which, on top of all the other negative issues surrounding it, caused it to, by the end of that generation, sell less than half the amount that the PlayStation 4 did. So, in order to correct that going into this new generation, Xbox has taken a number of steps to guarantee that they are both the most powerful and the least expensive console. And to do that, they launched two separate SKUs. The Xbox Series X is the most powerful console ever made. It's a great marketing tagline, but it's also true. It beats out the PlayStation 5 in almost every single performance category by a factor of 20 to 30 percent. And despite this power discrepancy, it is the exact same price as the PlayStation 5. But in order to make sure that they were also less expensive than the competitor, they put out the Xbox Series S, which is a console that is almost exactly as capable as the Series X. It is able to do HDR, it's able to do ray tracing. It has all of those features, just instead of doing them at 4K, it does them at 1080p. And for that trade-off, they're able to drop the price $200 from 500 to 300, making it the same price as the Nintendo Switch, which for a number of reasons, the price included, has been flying off the shelves for years, and I expect that the Series S will, to a lesser extent, do the same thing. So, going into this next generation, they have corrected their first-party lineup. They have the most powerful console and the most affordable console. So what is their strategy going forward to make themselves even more appealing? Xbox's strategy going forward seems to come down to three major categories, the first of which is compatibility and convenience. The Xbox Series X is backwards compatible with four generations of video games. The Xbox Original, the Xbox 360, the Xbox One, and now the Xbox Series X and S. And this is something that is unheard of in the games industry. You look over at their competitors like Sony and you see that they're shutting down the PS3, the PSP, and the PS Vita stores without providing a new place for you to buy those games, meaning that a lot of that content is just going to be lost to time. Or you look over at Nintendo, who will re-release their Mario and Zelda games on just about every single platform that they put out, instead of just letting you continue to play the games that you've already bought on your new hardware. And on top of all that, 
on top of just letting you continue to play what you've already paid for and respecting your purchase, they're going out of their way to make sure that even your older games are playing better than ever before on new hardware. With things like Smart Delivery, FPS Boost, and Auto HDR, I can boot up Oblivion from the 360 on my Xbox Series X and it'll run at 4K60 when it never did before, and that's absolutely amazing. And on top of that even, I can boot that game up on my console, save it, move over to my PC, pick up that save exactly where I left off, then move to my mobile phone, I can move to my old console, back and forth in any combination that I want, and it just works. I don't have to jump through any hoops, I just save the game and open it up on another device and my save is right there, ready to go, and it's absolutely amazing. The second major pillar of their strategy going forward is Game Pass. This is the Netflix style subscription service for video games, and it's the best deal in gaming. For $15 a month, you get access to hundreds of games, including every single first party Xbox title that they will release for the foreseeable future on the exact same day that those games release in the stores. And as we talked about earlier, the Xbox first party studio family is looking more powerful than ever, meaning that games like Fallout, Elder Scrolls, Doom, whatever Double Fine does next, Hellblade, the list goes on and on and on, will be just added into your service at no additional cost to you on the exact same day that they release. And it's not just Microsoft games going into Game Pass. You also have EA Play, meaning that every single EA game is also in there. All of the major sports titles, all of the Star Wars titles, uh, all of the Battlefield titles. Uh, you get indie support that is absolutely unmatched from ID at Xbox. Things like Cuphead and other games that may not have been able to even exist without Microsoft support launching day one into Game Pass. And on top of that, they are continuously going out and making third party deals to get other games launching day one onto their service, including major releases like recently Outriders and in the near future MLB The Show 21, which up until recently was a first party exclusive PlayStation game. Game Pass is going to be the go-to service going forward until the point where it becomes like Netflix, that thing that everybody just has, because there's absolutely no reason not to. The third, but possibly the most game-changing pillar of their strategy going forward is the cloud. Now I know for a core gamers, and particularly for those of us over here in the West, playing a game through the cloud sounds less than ideal and you know it's true that you're never going to get the same level of performance streaming as you can through local hardware it's just a fact of the matter but what you have to understand is that there are literally billions of people across the globe who play video games but don't own a console or a pc and who don't want to and those are people who play games through their phone and through their tablet this is especially true in the Japanese audience, who, historically speaking, that's a market that Xbox has not been able to really break into. But if they can offer this amazing library of games through Game Pass to the Japanese audience on devices that they already own, like their cell phones and their tablets, it could be an absolutely massive influx of people into the Xbox ecosystem, which is a really good deal for everyone involved. And that cloud streaming library is already absolutely massive. All of Game Pass just about is in there. They just added all of the backwards compatible games into cloud streaming. If they can make sure that this technology works right and appeals to the right audiences, it's gonna be a game-changing system for Xbox. 
So that's what I think Xbox's strategy for the new generation of consoles is. Improve the first party until the point where people cannot deny its strength. Have both the most powerful console and the most affordable console. Offer services like Game Pass that get people spending more and more time in the ecosystem. Offer features like cross-save and backwards compatibility that lets the audience know that you both respect them and their purchases and branch into new markets by leveraging the power of the cloud. And if they continue along this path, I really can't imagine any way that they could possibly fail. But let me know what you think about this strategy in the comments down below. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, this video was requested by a viewer. So if you have any ideas for videos you would like to see me make, please leave those down there as well. And while you're down there, why not give this video a like, share it with a friend, or better yet, subscribe to the channel because your support really does mean a lot to me. But until next time, I'll see you around.